Thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it's interesting. As I was preparing for today, my 12-year-old daughter said, Dad, why are you always doing these presentations? You know what I told her? I, I do it because I like the introductions. So I want to thank you for that very generous uh, introduction. I want to begin by reminding you of the words of author Neil Postman, who said, children are living messages that we send to a time we will not see. And the message that we have to send by way of our children is one of hope. Hope is what drives improvement. And improving our schools and ultimately our students' life outcomes is what we're all hoping for for the future. So I believe that us in public education have to ensure that all students have these kinds of outcomes. I believe, in fact, that we have to guarantee that every student who walks through our door gets these kinds of outcomes. And, you know, guarantee. When's the last time you had a guarantee? Because a guarantee is a very strong word. And I have to tell you, the last time I had a guarantee, I was 16 years old. And my parents said, Chris, if you're not in by midnight, I guarantee you will not see the light of day. So this is the kind of commitment that I think that we have to make. And the first one is, is a healthy start. Good nutrition and intellectual stimulation. Now more than ever, we know the importance of the early years. We also know that students get better outcomes in life and in school when they have a caring adult in their lives. It's also important that we make sure that every uh, school, every classroom is a safe place for students and for staff. And again, a safe school is a shared responsibility. A safe community is a shared responsibility. No one person can make it safe by themselves, but together we can ensure that we provide those kinds of environments because those are the best environments in which all students and all staff get an opportunity to thrive. And I say this not only as a director of education, but as a parent. I have two children in our system, and when I send them off to school each and every day, first and foremost is I want them to be safe. And of course we have to ensure that they have the tools to succeed. And literacy and numeracy are the foundation of the work that we need to do at our schools. But we're also making that shift now, 21st century learning, and we have to also make sure that they can collaborate, that they can communicate, that they're critical thinkers, and that they are creative in the way that they solve problems. And finally, an opportunity to make a positive difference in their world. I'm absolutely blown away by the level of consciousness of today's youth. So part of what we have asked them to do is we now have a social justice action plan where it is now an expectation that every school will be doing something to make a difference in their world, both locally and globally. So you heard a little bit about me uh, in the introduction, but just let me tell you a little bit more about Chris Spence. First of all, I am who I am, and it's important that you understand that I am a former football player. Now, now, now the reason I tell you that is because th the last time I was doing a presentation, I overheard some people talking about these football players, okay? They're driving home after practice and they run out of gas. So they have to park the car, walk a couple miles, get some gas and come back. So they want to make sure that the car is going to be safe. So one of the players says, okay, you guys, you go to the back. I'm going to turn on the hazard lights. Tell me if they're working. So he, uh, he goes, okay, guys, are the, are the hazards working? And the football players are standing at the back and they're going, yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> Now, if that's your perception of football players, I'm going to try and change it just a little bit today. <laughs> I believe, as educators, that we have to have a moral purpose, and that moral purpose is to make a difference in the lives of the students that we seek to reach and teach. Critical to our success is to ensure that there's a climate of high expectations in every classroom of every school. And it's not just about raising the bar, it's also about a commitment to reteach regroup, and make sure that all students have the resources that they need to be successful. And I share with you a story that's been making its rounds, I think, that really illuminates the point. And it's about this grade 9 class from hell. It's now October, and they've gone through four different teachers. And the word on this particular group of learners is, you know what, they just, they just don't want to learn. They don't listen, they don't cooperate, they don't do their homework. So they ask a, a highly decorated teacher, retired teacher, to come back and support the class. And she's working with this class, and, and things are going not so well. And after about three weeks, she says, enough's enough. I'm going back into retirement. She goes down to the office to hand in her le letter of resignation to the principal. Now, the principal's not there. And she does something she knows she shouldn't have done. But she goes into the principal's special files, and she sees the profiles of these students. And she's absolutely blown away by what she sees. She sees IQ numbers of 125, 130, the worst offender in the class, an IQ of 140, 
Well, she goes back to the classroom the next day and she just raises the bar. You will learn. You will do your homework. I will reteach. I will regroup. Together, we are going to make sure that we cover the curriculum and it's going to be a great place for all to learn. Well, in no time at all, this is now the best performing, best behaved class in the whole school. Principal is just absolutely blown away, calls her down, says, please, share the secrets of your success. How did you do it? How did you turn them around? And she's feeling a little awkward. She says, you know, I, I did something I know I shouldn't have done. But I went into your special files. I saw those IQ numbers, and I knew that they were capable of so much more. So I just went back, and I raised the bar. And the principal looks at her and says, listen, i got to tell you, those numbers that you saw, those weren't their IQ numbers. Those were their locker numbers. <laughs> but again, it just underscores the importance of creating a climate for high expectations. And as I said earlier, literacy for life is the foundation skills that all students need. So we have to make sure that every student has a capacity to listen attentively, speak persuasively, read with understanding, and write with command. In Richmond, Virginia, and this is so troubling, the local penitentiary can now predict how many cells that they will need based on the number of grade two students reading below grade level. You see, what we're doing is we're saving lives. And the truth of the matter is, underdeveloped literacy skills are the number one reason why students are retained, assigned to special education, and why they fail to graduate from high school. And the truth of the matter is, adolescents entering the adult world in the 21st century will read and write more than any other time in human history. Improvement is not a mystery. Consider. If this happens in every classroom of every school, I can guarantee that all students are going to improve. First, we have to have belief. We have to believe in our students. We have to believe that with skilled and knowledgeable instruction in safe and caring environments, all students will be successful. We have to understand that sometimes students just need more time, so time tailored to specific student needs. And an understanding that not all students learn the same way or at the same rate. You see, traditionally, the student has always followed the teacher. But now, more than ever, we need the teacher to follow the student and build on what that student knows and can do. And all of this needs to be done through an equity lens, equity being equal access to the benefits a system has to offer. But that may require differentiated treatment. You see, in education, I really do believe that it is. The work that we do really is about social justice which begins by gaining a passion for the plight of disadvantaged students. And like French philosopher Denis Diderot said, passions, only great, great passions can elevate the soul to do great things. We have to have a passion for the work that we do and those that we lead as we continually ask ourselves, who tends to be privileged? Who tends to be marginalized? How can we take action in the classroom to interrupt these cycles of oppression? And I get it, we are living in a different world. Technology is no longer an option, it's an essential tool for learning. We've gone from chalkboards to smart boards. My, my friend's two-year-old son started crying because he was tapping the TV and it wasn't going on. <laughs> Work is different, tools are different, communication is different. I, and I put up my hand here because I just bought my 12-year-old daughter a cell phone. She's like, yeah, everyone has one, Dad. She's texting her friends, she's calling her friends. And I got friends who tell me it's only going to get worse. A friend of mine has a 16-year-old daughter who spends three to four hours a night on the phone. So one night the phone rings, and she was off after half an hour. And he says to her, wow, half an hour. And she looks at him and says, well, what do you expect? It was the wrong number. <laughs> Information is different. Kids are different. Obesity has now surpassed smoking as the number one health risk in North America. So we have a moral obligation to make sure that our students are getting daily physical activity. Perhaps there's no more relevant issue to our students right now than mental health, which impacts one in five. And I'm really proud of some of the work that we've, we're doing because now we have, uh, we are, I think, one of the first boards in Ontario to have a mental health uh, coordinator to address these issues. Learning is different. I don't know about you, but I always reflect on my time in school. And I still remember sitting in that math class with a big sign over the, over the clock that said, time will pass 
will you? And that was supposed to motivate us, right? <laughs> so with all of these differences, teaching and learning must also be different. Because we're, we're dealing with a generation of students that some have never lived without a computer, gotten a busy signal, used a phone booth, lived in a house without multiple TVs and remote control. You see, for them, Google has always been a verb. And Madden? Madden's always been a, a video game, not a Super Bowl winning coach. But our job is to teach the kids that we have, not the kids that we used to have, not the kids that we wish we had, not the kids who exist only in our dreams. And when I talk to today's kids, they tell me that they want to be creators. They can be a filmmaker on YouTube, a recording artist on Second Life, an opinion leader on all the blogs. But when they come into our classrooms, our schools, they have to power down. So we have to find a way to bring the 21st century into our schools. Because in the 21st century, our students will be selling to the world, buying from the world, working for international companies, managing employees from other countries and cultures, competing with people on the other side of the world for jobs and markets, working with people all over the world in joint ventures and global work teams, solving global problems such as AIDS, environmental problems, and resolving conflicts. So the question is, are our students ready? Because in the global economy, and society of the 21st century, all children will be left behind if their education is not organized with a global context in mind. You see, I don't think we know half of what these kids can do. I was reading about a school district in the United States that only allows computers in the classroom that are built by students themselves. I mean, what a brilliant concept and so doable from the perspective of student talent. You see, the same kids that we say can't read and write well, can remember and create complex lyrics set to hip-hop music. The same kids who can't even spell systems thinking can understand movement on a basketball court, anticipate moves, and create elegant responses. Don't tell me they can't learn. It's how we teach them and how we engage them. One of the great things about the role that I'm in is I get to visit a lot of classrooms and a lot of schools. And the other day I was in a grade two classroom. And this girl, she was drawing this beautiful, beautiful picture with all of these colors. And so I said to her, what are you drawing? And she said, I'm drawing God. And I looked at her and I said, but nobody's ever seen God before. And she looked right back at me and said, well, they will in a minute. <laughs> See, I, I love the story of Jillian Lynn because as a student, Jillian was driving her teachers crazy. She couldn't sit down. She was always fidgeting. So finally the teacher said to the mother, you know what, you gotta go get her tested. The mother reluctantly took Jillian to get her tested. And, and when the doctor was finished uh, with the test, he asked for a consultation outside. And as he was walking out, he gently turned on the radio. And through the observation window, they could see Jillian dancing so gracefully to the music. The doctor looked over the mother and said, there's nothing wrong with your daughter. She's a dancer, take her to dance school. And she did, ended up doing exactly that. And Jillian went on to have a brilliant career in dance. She was the choreographer fit for Fan of the Opera and Cats. But for us as educators, it should just be a reminder that our students have so many different learning styles. They can be picture smart, word smart, music smart, number smart, body smart, people smart, self smart. And part of our role is to ensure that we value and respect all of those learning styles and provide an opportunity to nurture and develop them. And as you know, relationships matter. They're absolutely key to the work that we do. Because you can't motivate a student you don't know. There's no learning without trust and respect, and neither are granted automatically by today's students. So this is a, a former student of mine. His name is Ricky. Now that the face has changed and the name has changed, but the, lo the lessons learned are timeless. You see, Ricky was a struggling student but Rickley was a gifted basketball player. And one of the things that I deeply believe is that there has to be that strong instructional relationship. And when you have that relationship with your students, I think anything can happen. And one of the things that I used to do is I was coaching when I first uh, met, met Ricky. And uh, over the course of the year, we had made great uh, progress. And uh, he was, as I said, a, a very gifted basketball player. So we went to a tournament one day and uh, we, we, we came back and, and I dropped the, the guys off. And I know I'm dating myself here, but, but I noticed my, my Walkman wasn't there. 
And, and I wasn't sure if someone lifted it. I wasn't sure if I left it at the gym or at home. So I was telling one of my colleagues, I said, you know, I'm not sure what to do because uh, my, my Walkman seems to be missing. Well, Ricky overheard that conversation. And Ricky called the team meeting. And he said to the guys, Sirs, Walkman is missing, and it better be on his desk tomorrow or you got to deal with me. Coming from Ricky, that meant something. Well, the next day there were three Walkmans on my desk, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but Ricky, again, was just a constant reminder to me of how important it is to make sure that we nurture those relationships uh, with our students. So Ricky said to me, uh, uh, Sir, you know what? Your, your Walkman's in, in pretty rough condition. Do you mind if I take it home? So he took it home, he worked on it, and he brought it back the next day, working in better condition than it ever has. You see, Ricky had a gift for working with his hands, a gift we would have never, ever discovered. So for me, he became a metaphor of what can happen to our students when they get pushed out of our schools. So the most important thing that we can do is to believe in our students until they can believe in themselves. Jackie Robinson is a hero of mine. And, and, and Jackie really, I think, captures everything that I want to say here today. Because Jackie broke baseball's color barrier back in 1942 when he broke onto the scene with his electrifying style. He became a symbol of hope to millions and millions of people. But he was also a target of hate mail and death threats. And one game, Jackie was visibly shaken by a threat that he received earlier in the day, and it just threw off his game. He committed errors, struck out, just wasn't playing his game. But a timeout was called on the field, and his teammate, Pee Wee Reese, walked over to Jackie, put his hand on his shoulder, and he said, I believe in you. You're the greatest player that I ever played with. Someday you will be in the Hall of Fame. Well, Jackie went on to score the game-winning run. And when he got inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1962, he recounted that incident. And he said his teammate Pee Wee Reese saved his life because he believed him. And I believe that that's the opportunity that we as educators have each and every day. Believing in our students and in our own ability to make a difference. So my message has been that we have to make a simple but powerful commitment to all of our students. That the opportunity to pursue their dreams will be constrained only by the limits of their imagination and never their postal code. And I believe with every fiber of my being that we can accomplish that as a public education system. Thank you.